uh, then and all the processes from malting to brewing and, and for to obtain the uh, fresh beer and finally the um, uh, processes or the parameters that are uh, uh, that belong to the process itself that uh, result in the evolution of the aldehyde through the process. Um, so the content of this presentation is as follows. First, I will just summarize some of the materials and methods uh, involved in this uh, research. And then I will go through directly through some of the results in every of these uh, steps that I just mentioned. So first, uh, how the staling aldehydes uh, are uh, present in malt. Uh, then uh, how is the beer aging process and uh, how can we obtain an estimation of the overall aging score that I will explain in a minute. Uh, and finally, uh, a more uh, throughout study of the aldehydes concentration through all the beer process and to end with some uh, of the conclusions of this study. So the materials and methods. So first, as I mentioned, it, this is a collaboration. So the samples uh, or the data that are used for this research uh, were processed, were produced, uh, processed and tested in the uh, laboratory and, and the enzyme laboratory here, and fermentation and brewing laboratory here. And these uh, samples correspond to two groups. So in the first group, we had 23 samples of malt, different malts that were a uh, brew uh, to obtain the fresh beer and then uh, they uh, led uh, to be stored to obtain the aged beer corresponding to that. And then for these first samples, we had a measure or, or the people in the laboratory had measured uh, both the aldehyde contents throughout the process and then also the physical chemical properties of the malt and the beer at every stage. Um, for the second group, we had uh, only 17 uh, different malts uh, that were again brew and led uh, to, to be aged. And for these uh, beers, we had only the measurements of the aldehydes, not the physical, physical chemical properties. Um, some of the physical chemical properties that I will explain or talk about during the presentation that maybe are worth to, to explain a bit more are the TV index. This is normally used as an indication of the heat stress during the process. Uh, basically because it tells us uh, about the progression of the milliard reactions during the both malting and brewing process. Um, then, for example, we have uh, the content of specific fatty acids, fatty acids the uh, three hydroxy fatty acids, and then also the total content of uh, free amino nitrogen compounds, so amino acids and peptides and things like that. And then we have uh, activity of several enzymes uh, that regarding meal, malt, sorry, and then Something very important for beer is the overall aging score. This is a kind of a sensory analysis that is performed uh, by several experts that test the beer and evaluate the quality of the flavor of the beer, the beer sorry, and uh, assign a value to this beer as the overall aging score. Um, apart from that, we have some very clear properties of beer. Uh, we get again TV index, same of the malt. And then we have some, for example, these flavonoids and protocyanidins, sorry. Uh, these are un known antioxidants that prevent for, that come from the hops. So th those are also relevant properties that I will be discussing about. And then we have all this group here that you see at the bottom of uh, trans and cis uh, alpha acids that also come from uh, hops that are related with the bitterness of the beer. So also very important that I will be discussing about them later in the presentation. Um, very quickly, some of the methods, you might be familiar with these methods, um, but for those that are not familiar, I will try to explain them. So we are, I'm talking about uh, data-driven modeling methods. So we have principal component analysis, and this is to find uh, the directions of variance in the data. Uh, so basically we have a transformation of the input data into a latent variable space uh, where linear combinations of the input variables are uh, uh, expressed. And then we have the partial least squares that is basically to build a regression model. So basically we again have a linear transformation of the input data, but also the output data. And what we want to do is to find the main directions of correlations between them and express them in our latent variable space. So it's a kind of, uh, Expl ex uh, extension of the principal component analysis if you want to see it like that. Then we have some uh, more uh, very recent uh, as a tool for data visualization for dimensionality reduction called TSNIM. I will show some more results of this. Basically this method is similar to principal component analysis. The objective of it is to find a reduced space where we can uh, visualize uh, uh, clusters or trends or identify 
information from uh, the, the original large space uh, um, of properties. And it is based on the joint probabilities. So basically we express the joint probabilities in the input space and the joint probabilities on the reduced space. And what we want to do is to try to minimize the difference between both, the, what is called the Kulabak and later where divergence. Uh, so we might minimize this uh, divergence. And then with that, we find uh, optimal expression of the data in a reduced space. Um, so to go already into the results, I will be first talking about MALT. So uh, what happened with the MALT? So we can study the MALT and the properties of the MALT. Uh, and we have the um, aldehydes that I already uh, mentioned in the beginning, but we have also the properties of this MALT. And the first thing that we can uh, look at is the correlations between aldehydes and, uh, and these properties. And you could already see in this correlation matrix that there are really strong correlations between them, uh, both directly and inverse correlation. Um, and basically this is telling us uh, specifically in the, in, the, in the point of aldehydes that at the stage of MALT, the, com the composition in aldehydes is very correlated. So all aldehydes uh, one way or another uh, um, evolve in the same direction meaning that the phenomena that produce them in the stage of melting are correlated themselves. And also we can learn from it that uh, this uh, content of aldehyde is uh, inversely correlated with some uh, specific properties like uh, the um, humidity or the content of uh, some of the uh, fatty acids in the, in the melt. Uh, but then we can also perform the uh, principal component analysis to learn about clusters in the samples. So every dot here is one of the samples in the, in, the, in the data. And we can identify certain clusters of MAL that have similar properties. Uh, we can find also relations between the direction where they are located in the, in the principal component uh, space. Uh, and this already is telling us information about how different origins of the MAL, how different uh, uh, parameters during the melting process are uh, resulting in, in different uh, results for the uh, content of aldehydes. Um, so the main objective here, or one of the main questions could be, can we predict what is the total content of aldehydes in the malt based on the physical chemical properties of it? And the question is that uh, in the answer of it is that basically we managed to do it. Uh, for this, we use a PLS a regression model with some uh, feature selection. So basically we reduce the set of properties of the, uh, of the malt to this uh, list that you see at the bottom. Um, and these properties are good enough to predict what is the total level of aldehydes of the malt. Uh, and we saw already some interesting information from it. So no, it's not only about the ability of the model to predict, but also what we can learn from it. And what we learn specifically is that um, the, for example, the TV index that was expected in a way to, to contribute a lot for the, for, the, for the indication or for the information about the aldehydes in the malt is contributing mainly, you know, or is a good informative uh, parameter, mainly for a malt that has a low content and a high content of aldehyde. So you will find in this type of malts uh, that the TV index is a very good uh, parameter to identify that this is the, the, the case. While in the case of more uh, mean values of, uh, let's say, uh, content of aldehydes, you will rely or you will need to rely in other properties like humidity or the content of free amino nitrogen products uh, to be able to predict what is the content of aldehydes. Um, so as I pointed out here at the bottom, it, the relative contribution of the properties is different depending on the level of total aldehydes. And this is already a quite good learning from, from the malt. If we look at the phenomena occurring do, during the beer aging, uh, what we want first is uh, to answer the question, okay, are we able to uh, identify or maybe classify uh, aged beer to make it uh, clear when you have an aged beer and separately from, from uh, discriminated from a fresh beer. And for this, uh, what I did was to perform some um, principal component analysis and then some clustering and to basically also identify those uh, properties of the beer that are really good uh, that can be used uh, on their own to identify this difference between fresh and, and aged beer. And as you can see it here, if you take as input all physical chemical properties of the beer and the content of aldehydes with only two 
parameters, the cold haze, that is basically the turbidity of the beer uh, when it is cooled down, and the furfural content are just uh, those properties required to obtain a very good classification and to be able to identify when you have a fresh or a aged beer. Uh, in the case that you have less uh, information about the beer and you, for example, have only physical chemical properties, the classification is a bit uh, less accurate. You have a bit more, um, let's say, a less discriminative uh, plane to, to make difference between the two clusters. But uh, still you are able to do the classification and uh, what you need in this case is again the cold haze is a, a very good uh, predictor for this. And again, it comes into picture also the content of uh, alpha amino acids that I was telling about that these come from, uh, I'm sorry, alpha amino acids, no, so uh, alpha acids that come from the um, hops. And this is more related with the loss of uh, or degradation of bitterness that is also occurring in parallel uh, to the aging. So it is also a good indicator for, for aging. Um, if we want to predict the overall aging score, as I mentioned it before, uh, this is a sensory analysis that is performed in the beer to evaluate the quality and the flavor stability of the beer. Um, and the question is here, can we build a model that is more objective than the sensory analysis? Because the sensory analysis in the end is somebody that is a, a, an expert on the field, but that needs to give a, a, an evaluation on the beer itself. So the question is, can we actually, based on the properties of the beer, estimate this, this what could be this evaluation? And the, the answer again is yes, with certain uh, uh, level of uh, uh, accuracy, you can do it. And you can do it both uh, starting from the properties of the aged beer, so you wait till till the beer was aged. Actually, you measure the beer and you kind of already can estimate what is the quality of this beer. So you estimate the overall aging score. But we can do it also from the fresh beer. So basically you measure the properties of the fresh beer and you will already estimate what is gonna be the overall uh, aging score of this beer. And what is more, 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 more uh, interesting about this is that if you see the contributions from the properties, uh, it is different. So when you are looking at the aged beer, you, you rely on knowing what is the content mainly of aldehydes, some other properties as well, but mainly aldehydes. While you are looking uh, at the fresh beer, you are looking mainly at the properties, uh, physical chemical properties of the beer. So that means already, and this is one of the conclusions of the study, uh, that actually at the level of fresh beer, the content of aldehydes is not so informative about how it's gonna be the aging process itself. The, 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 the progression in the concentration of aldehydes through the aging is kind of independent of the starting point in a way. Um, <clears throat> uh, we can also, and in the, in the end, the, the final goal of all, all this study was to try to uh, understand and try to predict uh, how the aldehydes uh, evolve through all the process of so from malt to beer and to um, aged beer. Uh, and in this case, um, some of the first observations from the correlation is that if you look uh, at the top of this uh, correlation matrix, you will see a really red uh, uh, cluster of uh, high correlated uh, properties indicating that at the level of malt, as I probably mentioned it already at the beginning, all aldehydes are strongly correlated. This is meaning that the phenomena that are occurring during the malting and in the malt itself uh, to produce these aldehydes are correlated in a way. So that's at the level of, at the very beginning of the process. But when you go through all the process, so when you brew this malt and then you wait for it to age, these correlations kind of disappear. So the, the, the phenomena kind of take different ways and you can um, only for certain uh, aldehydes uh, try uh, track the correlation through all the process. So for example, the met methylbutanol, the phenylacetaldehyde and the um, methionol that are striker aldehydes, you can see that the correlation is through all the process, meaning that uh, the, the concentration from the beginning till the end is gonna be informative on how the aging is occurring, at least related with these aldehydes. For the rest, you won't be able to, to really track it through the process. And also some interesting phenomena is occurring with furfural. As you can see, it is the only one that is gonna, it is showing some uh, inverse correlation that is quite, quite interesting as well. Um, if uh, uh, when I applied the TSNE uh, algorithm to this data, uh, which, uh, what I saw there was also some interesting trends. 
and cluster. So basically this is the result of the TSNE. All of, all of the figures are the same, but they are colored depending on different parameters. So you have the total aldehydes, the furfural, the methylpropanol, a uh, uh, subgroup of the Strecker aldehydes, those that I mentioned that are correlated through all the process, and then the fatty acid uh, oxidation aldehydes. Um, and as you can see, if you look at the total aldehydes for fular methylpropanol, you can already see the trends. Uh, so basically, you see that the evolution of total aldehydes is mostly uh, as a result of the evolution of furfural as well in the samples, but a bit uh, also the contribution for methylpropanol, while the other two groups are not really contributing to the final total aldehydes. And you have clusters of high furfural content and clusters of uh, high methylpropanol content. Um, this is already indicating that the phenomena at the level of HBR is kind of uh, uncorrelated and if we want to be able to predict it based on uh, PLS mod methods, for example, uh, you will need to build independent uh, models and that's what uh, I did. So basically, uh, I built a methylpropanol predictive uh, model based on PLS that uh, resulted in, in some accurate predictions the same independent model for furfural and then an independent for, uh, model for the Strecker aldehydes. And what again is maybe more important than the prediction itself is to understand what are the contributions of the different parameters. And just to summarize uh, some of the observations here is that, for example, in the case of Strecker aldehydes, the, the predictors are actually the same aldehydes uh, at the level of fresh beer or the malt. So actually, if you know the aldehydes, in stages, early stages, you will know what is going to be already what is going to be the content of aldehydes at the end after aging. In the case of furfural, it is actually related with other properties, not aldehydes. And in the case of methylpropanol, it is mainly related with itself. So also with the methylpropanol and also something very interesting that came up here is the content of uh, antioxidants, so flavonoids and um, the molecules that come from, from hops that uh, help uh, reducing the oxidative uh, reactions in the, in the aging. Um, so just to conclude, uh, so we have, uh, or I have trained a PLS model uh, to estimate the total aldehydes in the malt based on physical chemical properties. Uh, from this, we identify these four properties as the main predictors for this. And, but also we identify that their contribution is dependent on the actual uh, level of aldehydes uh, then uh, we built uh, two classification models for to discriminate age and fresh beer and um, we identified the, the main uh, predictors for this classification. Uh, we uh, trained a model for a, PL, a PLS model for the prediction of the overall hygiene score um, and uh, also predictive models for the content of methylpropanol, furfural and strecker aldehydes. Um, so just uh, to thank here, the, this uh, is a project that was uh, funded by KU Leuven uh, Research and uh, it was a collaboration with the uh, Laboratory of Enzyme Fermentation and Brewing here at the campus. So thank you very much and if you have any question, I'm happy to answer any question.